This week on 2024 Campaign Trail, C-SPAN takes you to South Carolina, where former President Donald Trump continued his push to secure this year's GOP presidential nomination. And to Texas, where rival Nikki Haley took her message to yet another Super Tuesday state. From Michigan, part of independent Robert F. Kennedy's visit there, as he sought to gain ballot access in the Great Lakes state. Also, a conversation with the New Jersey Globe's Joey Fox on the latest in New Jersey's 2024 Senate race. But first, a look at President Biden's latest campaign strategy to woo younger voters through social media. Axios reported the president's re-election campaign officially launched a TikTok account on Super Bowl Sunday with this video, which was captioned, LOL, hey guys. Chiefs or Niners? Two great quarterbacks, hard to decide. But if I didn't say I was for the Eagles and I'd be sleeping alone, my wife's a Philly girl. Game or commercials? Game. Game or halftime show? Game. Jason Kelsey or Travis Kelsey? Mama Kelsey. I understand she makes great chocolate chip cookies. Deviously plotting to rig the season so the Chiefs would make the Super Bowl or the Chiefs just being a good football team? You'd get in trouble if I told you. Trump or Biden? Are you kidding? <laughs> Biden. The Republican presidential frontrunner and former President Donald Trump was out on the campaign trail this week in South Carolina. He told supporters that his Republican rival, Nikki Haley, would not be his vice presidential pick while praising Senator Tim Scott, his former presidential nomination challenger turned endorser. Here's part of that rally from North Charleston, South Carolina. Do you also have a person known as Nikki Birdbrain, Haley, Birdbrain, who tried to double your gas tax here in South Carolina and also supports a 23% national sales tax. By the way, Henry will never do that, that's for sure. I will never let that happen to you. It's not going to happen. Henry wouldn't let it happen either, frankly. The radical left Democrats want Nikki Haley because they know she's easy to beat. Look at her polls. Her polls are terrible against Biden. She wants to gut Medicare and Social Security and raise the retirement age by 10 years. How about Social Security? You have another year to go, and then you learn it's not a year. It's going to be 11 years to go. I don't know. Somehow, some people aren't going to like that too much. That's what she wants to do. She's wanted to do that for a long time. She gave land away to China, but most importantly, I'm beating Biden in almost every poll by a lot, whereas she loses to Biden in virtually every poll. And her numbers, by the way, are tanking. Her numbers are going down. As she gets angrier, crazier, and suffers deeper, deeper scars from Trump derangement syndrome. She's got a terminal case. Terminal case. Trump derangement syndrome. Not a nice thing. There are many people afflicted with it. Most of them are gone. On the amnesty bill, Nikki sided with crooked Joe Biden. I sided with the American people. She sided with Biden. Nikki has gone so far left because of her Democrat donors. She's actually got very little money now because they all gave up because she's given like there was one poll that said she has no chance. That's pretty tough, zero. I give her a 1%. I don't really mean it, but I give her a 1%. And that she's not just attacking me, she's actually attacking the entire re — she is really going after the Republican Party. And that's very bad. We got to beat Biden. We got to beat Biden. Three years ago, she said, all of us who worked with Donald Trump witnessed the tremendous amount of love and respect he has for our military. He was determined to protect our military. We had many conversations in the NSC meetings about protecting them. He loved our military so much, is what she said. Now she says, well, I don't know too much about him in the military. And on that, though, she was correct. I love our military. You have a big military here. I love our vets. I've taken care of our vets like no president has ever done. No president has ever given the vets what I gave them. I gave her the job at the United Nations, 90 percent for one reason, because I wanted to make Henry McMaster the governor of the great state of South Carolina. And he's done a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Peggy, thank you for being here. Thank you, Henry. Nikki is also political best friends with a guy named Mitt Romney. Has that one ever heard of? That's not a good thing who has run — really, I mean, he's been run out of office, essentially. Remember, he was with the mask running down Pennsylvania Avenue with Antifa? I said, this guy's not good. 
No, he didn't run because he couldn't have had my support. And in Utah, he couldn't have won the race. He could not have won. So he didn't leave very easily, but he left. He's gone. He's gone. Unless he changes his mind, maybe he will. I hope he does. Then he goes down in defeat. And she seriously thought about supporting a gentleman named as Barack Hussein Obama. Well, it's right on the tape. I don't know if they're going to put up that tape, but it's right on that tape. Barack Hussein Obama, she wanted to support him, and she decided to go with Romney instead. But when I say that Obama is the president of our country, ba ba ba, they go, he doesn't know that's Biden. He doesn't know. So it's very hard to be sarcastic. When I interpose, because I'm not a Nikki fan and I'm not a Pelosi fan. And when I purposely interposed names, they said he didn't know Pelosi from Nikki, from Tricky Nikki, Tricky Nikki. He didn't know I interposed, and they make a big deal out of it. I said, no, no, I think they both stink. They have something in common. They both stink. And remember this, when I make a statement like that about Nikki, that means she will never be running for vice president. She will never be running for vice president. Remember that. There are things you can say about people. Do you ever see where, you know, you're really hitting one person, they're hitting you, you know, but it goes to a level. But we're at the level now, I am in particular, you know, bird brain and lots of other things. There are things that when you say that, you're never gonna have her, so I hope nobody wants her, because I think she's absolutely terrible. She's terrible. So you're never gonna have her, and I don't think anybody is very devastated. We do have a lot of great people, by the way. We do have a lot. He's screaming, Tim's got. By the way, I tell Tim, Tim's here someplace. I tell Tim, because I watch his campaign. And you know the truth? It, it was a beautiful thing in a way. He's a modest person. And I called him up, because he was defending me on Deface the Nation. Did you ever watch? Ladies and gentlemen, CBS, ladies and gentlemen, it's Tim Scott on Deface the Nation. Because they do. Or Meet the Fake News. Remember, most of it, ABC, this is ABC fake news. They're all fake. They're horrible. You know, if they ever turned conservative to a conservative way, or let's say it differently, if they ever turned to common sense, you know what? Their ratings would triple. I tell the top people, I said, if you ever went common sense, your ratings would triple. But I told Tim, so he was, uh, look, he did well, but he wasn't as forceful as he is because he feels you know, he doesn't want to talk about himself. It's sort of interesting. And then I see him on Deface the Nation and Meet the Press and all the stuff, and he's just killing everybody. And I called him, I said, you know, you're a much better candidate for me than you were for yourself. I mean it. This guy is the best. He was like a different person. He was like a different person. And I say that with admiration. Because I'm the opposite. I'm much better for me than I would be for somebody else. I would be terrible. I'd be terrible. On Thursday, former President Trump was in New York City for a civil trial, one of numerous cases he's facing this year. After leaving the hearing, he told reporters the trial was interfering in his ability to run for president. So instead of being in South Carolina and other states campaigning, I'm stuck here. It's an election interference case. Nobody's ever seen anything like it in this country. It's a disgrace. It's a disgraceful situation, actually. And we'll just have to figure it out. I'll be here during the day, and I'll be campaigning during the night. Biden should be doing the same thing, but he'll be sleeping. This is all from the DOJ. This all comes out of Washington. They're coordinated with the district attorney and the AG. The case tomorrow, which is a rigged deal, is uh, all coordinated with the uh, district attorney, and it's coordinated with the attorney general of New York, Leticia James. You ought to be ashamed of herself. She's campaigned for years of trying to get Trump without knowing anything about me. It's all a rig. It's a rig state. It's a rig city. It's a shame. They ought to, what they ought to do is go out and take care of the violent crime and the migrant crime. It's election interference by Biden because it's the only way he can think to get elected, because he's accomplished nothing. But I'm honored to sit here. I'm honored to sit here day after day after day on something that everybody says, the greatest legal scholars say, 
It's not even a crime. Thank you very much. How do you plan on campaigning while you're in court, sir? I'll do it in the evening. Are you coming back tomorrow for the verdict? The latest poll from YouGov and The Economist showed a dead heat between President Biden and former President Trump in an assumed rematch this year. Both men garnered 44 percent support, with 12 percent of voters uncommitted to either candidate. Former President Trump has continued his campaign's attacks against not just the current president, but also his Republican rival Nikki Haley. Here's the latest ad his campaign has been pushing via digital channels this week. Prove the fact that Donald Trump says I want to cut Social Security or raise the age. I've never said that. There's the red challenge hat. Trump's challenging Haley's statement. Haley's claim she didn't call for raising the age of Social Security is under review. Tony, here's exactly what the official is looking at. Social Security, Medicare, how would you manage the entitlements? We say the rules have changed. What we do know is 65 is way too low, and we need to increase that. 65 is way too low, and we need to increase that. Let's take a look at another angle. We change retirement age to reflect life expectancy. I think the call is pretty clear, but let's go down to the field and see what official Gene Tooney has to say. After review, Nikki Haley clearly said she plans to change the rules and raise the age of Social Security. This results in cutting benefits for 82% of Americans. Bob, that was a rookie mistake by Haley. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Nikki Haley was in Texas this past week, part of a two-day fundraising swing through the Lone Star State. Texas news outlets reported fundraisers were hosted by prominent Texas Republicans, including Harlan Crow and Ross Perot Jr. Next, some of a public rally she held in Dallas, which was frequently interrupted by protesters supporting a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. Hello, Dallas! You know how to show up. Thank you. You know, I love this because when I was governor in South Carolina, I would always refer to South Carolina as mini Texas. Because we think alike. We act alike. We love our freedom. And we don't want government telling us what to do. <laughs> I love you too. You know, when we were, when I was governor, I came in, we took in a double digit unemployment state that had 11% unemployment. We had thousands of people on welfare and South Carolina was the butt of the jokes. And we rallied and we got to work. And by the time I left, we were building planes with Boeing. We were building more BMWs than any place in the world. We brought in Mercedes-Benz. We brought in Volvo. We had five international tire companies, and they were referring to us as the beast of the Southeast, which I love. We moved that 11% unemployment down to 4%. We announced jobs in every county in the state. We passed tort reform and pension reform, but we acknowledged some truths. We said, if you have to show picture ID to buy Sudafed, if you have to show picture ID to get on a plane, you should have to show picture ID to protect the integrity of the election process. We passed voter ID in South Carolina. We passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country. President Obama sued us over it, and we won. And by the time I left being governor, we were named the friendliest state in the country the most patriotic state in the country, and the number two state in the country people are moving to. You know, don't ever get upset about someone who does that and who may do, there may be more. Don't ever get upset about that because my husband and every man and woman in the military sacrifice every day for their right to do that.
We are blessed to live in America. Don't ever forget that. Republicans have lost the last seven out of eight popular votes for president. That's nothing to be proud of. We should want to win the majority of Americans. But the only way we're going to win the majority of Americans is if we have a new generational conservative leader. You know, it has been one year today that I announced that I ran for president. And what a year it's been. We had 14 people in the race. We defeated a dozen of, of the fellas. I just got one more fella I got to catch up to. We had 2% in Iowa, we moved it to 20%. They said we were down 30 points in New Hampshire, we ended up getting 43% of the vote. And when we got 43%, Donald Trump threw a temper tantrum. Now, I want to say this, hard truth. I voted for Donald Trump twice. I was proud to serve America in his administration. But the truth is, chaos follows him. Everywhere he goes, chaos follows him. And we can't be a country in disarray and a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. We won't survive it. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was in Grand Rapids, Michigan this past weekend. It was part of his ongoing effort to garner enough signatures from voters to get his name on the ballot in all 50 states. Following his remarks at the Grand Rapids rally, he talked to reporters about that effort and about recent allegations his campaign was coordinating with a political action committee. Here's some of those questions. Megan, Thank you for being here. So I got to ask, because it was filed yesterday in reference to the DNC's complaint, I know you said that they should get their own candidate who they believe in, but... Specifically, how do you respond to the allegations of to the, to the DNC allegations? They're completely false. They said that we were secretly colluding, but the evidence with the with a super PAC that my campaign was secretly colluding with the super PAC. But the uh, the voter application that they're offering as evidence is on our website, so there clearly was no secret. This is just another effort by the DNC to avoid an election and try to remove people, candidates, who are opposing President Biden from the ballot using the legal system. Eric? Uh, Mr. Kennedy, you've made it a policy throughout this campaign to not speak so much about your opponents and uh, their deficiencies. Uh, the developments of the last couple of days with regard to President Biden and the investigation or not there to be a, an investigation. Uh, and then his statement to the American public last night, what is your general impression? Uh, how can you qualify the situation? Do you mean the statement? You mean when, they, when the press was asking him about his cognitive issues? Correct. I, you know, I think the issue has been raised and I don't think it's character assassination to, uh, to challenge the president to, to come out and debate and to show the American public that he has the cognitive capacity to do this very, very difficult job. This is a job that uh, requires a lot of complexity, a lot of nuance, a lot of uh, very, very difficult decisions. This is the man who might get a phone call at three o'clock in the morning that your children and my children are depending on his answering it in a way um, that is, again, response to complexities. And uh, we have a right, as the American people, I think, to know that our president is actually leading the country and somebody else is not. And you know, there's, there's so many special interests now in Washington, D.C., um, big financial interests that are uh, trying to manipulate the political process and, I think those interests 
would just as soon have a, a president with cognitive deficits because it enlarges their power. I think it's really important for Americans to understand, for the president to show Americans with, with unscripted uh, encounters with voters, but also through debate, that he actually is capable of handling this job. As a quick follow-up, as president, if you were to determine that you couldn't remember significant chunks of your life, how would you address that? Well, I, you know, I would hope my family would say it's time to enjoy your retirement. Next question here. What are your thoughts about Judicial Watch reporting that um, the Secret Service confirmed that uh, Mayorkas and President Biden could provide you protection, Secret Service protection? Yeah, I, the the uh, the, lad, the the correspondence that has been recovered by Judicial Watch shows that the Secret Service was ordered by higher ops by in the DHS and the White House to deny, not to deny me Secret Service protection, regardless that the Secret Service had uh, produced a threat assessment that showed that I was at an elevated risk. What This is troublesome because we're living at a time when the federal, many Americans believe that the federal agencies have been weaponized for political purposes. And this is proof positive that that's happening, even with the Secret Service, which has always been sacrosanct. I'm the first presidential candidate in history that has been denied Secret Service protection after requesting it, and there is no other. And it's been given to at least 30 times uh, other presidential candidates early, so prior to the 120-day day period. And, you know, when President Carter was president, and my uncle, my uncle and President Carter did not like each other. But when it became clear that my uncle was going to run, Teddy Kennedy was going to run for president, even before he declared, President Carter ordered that he be provided Secret Service protection because of the demonstrated risk to people in my family who are running for this office. And, uh, you know, my, my President Biden has a bust of my father who behind him in the Oval Office. My father was killed during a presidential campaign. And uh, and that's why Congress changed the law to make sure that presidential candidates were protected before the nominating convention. And, uh, you know, it's clear the Secret Service clearly wants to give me protection. They're being ordered not to by the White House. Next question. There's a billboard outside of Grand Rapids, Michigan, paid for by the DNC that says you are powered by Trump and MAGA. What's your response? I, uh, the DNC is saying because I, because one of my PACs, which I have nothing to do with, legally can have nothing to do with, accepted money from a Republic, traditionally Republican donor, that somehow this should disqualify me from uh, from people voting for me. Uh, we get money from Democrats, from Republicans and independents, and I'm proud that we're reaching across party lines, that we're trying to bridge the divide. President Biden says that he's trying to bridge the divide, but, but uh, this is just the opposite. It's saying that, you know, there's a big difference, in, you know, that you're not really American if you're a Republican. And I just don't believe that. I think we ought to have presidential candidates that are receiving support across political divides. We need to bridge the divide and heal this country. You've chosen not to attack other candidates. Um, they've attacked you, the Democrats in particular. Why do you think they're doing that? Why do I think they're... I think that they don't. They have a candidate who doesn't want to debate. And so they have to try to win the election by litigating against people, by trying to get people off the ballot, by denying me ballot access, uh, by litigating against the other uh, candidates to get them disqualified. So we won't have to do democracy in our country. And, you know, I feel like we should be modeling democracy around the world. I don't want to win this election because I'm not a fan of President Trump's I don't, I don't want to win this election by disqualifying them legally. I want the American people to decide who they want to be, have as president, and I want to beat him at fair and square. 
on a level playing field. And I think it's distressing that the Democrats don't want to do that. Sir, what do you think about Tim Mellon's donation to the PAC? He's a, a donor of Trump's. And in 2015, he wrote in his book uh, that black people were even more belligerent after the expansion of social programs in the 60s and 70s. And that in, the belligerent quote was a direct quote. And well, you know, I'm not, I am not legally allowed to talk to my PAC about any of these issues, any of the super PAC. And there are several super PACs that support my campaign. It would be against the law for me to tell a PAC to who or who they could not accept money from. And, you know, my opinion is that it's a good thing to have, to have uh, both Republicans and Democrats and independents giving to my PAC. I don't know anything about those comments and I can't verify them or validate them. But it would be illegal for me to pick up the phone and tell somebody you can't accept money from that PAC. Mr. Kennedy's campaign also made headlines for a Super Bowl ad, estimated to cost $7 million, put out by the American Values 2024 PAC. It harkened back to the iconic 1960 cycle presidential campaign ad supporting his uncle, President John F. Kennedy. Next, a look at that 1960 ad and then the Super Bowl ad for Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s current campaign. Do you want a man for president who's seasoned through and through? But not so doggone seasoned that he won't try something new. A man who's old enough to know. And young enough to do. Well, it's up to you. It's up to you. It's strictly up to you. Do you like a man who answers straight? A man who's always fair? We'll measure him against the others and when you compare. You cast your vote for Kennedy and the change that's overdue. So it's up to you. It's up to you. It's strictly up to you. For president who's seasoned through and through A man who's old enough to know And young enough to do Well, it's up to you, it's up to you It's strictly up to you American Values 2024 is responsible for the content of this advertisement. Longtime political analyst Charlie Cook was the guest at a National Association for Business Economics conference this week. There, he offered his predictions for this year's election including one that President Biden was unlikely to reach the 270 electoral votes he needed to win. Well, I, I think in retrospect, I think the Republican nomination was settled about seven or eight months ago, that when you have, in the case of, of former President Trump, you have somebody that's got about an 80 plus percent favorable rating among Republicans. Two thirds of Republicans at least tell pollsters they think he actually won in 2020. Big majorities think he's done little or of Republicans, little or nothing wrong, or not any more than anybody else had, but all the accusations are politically motivated, therefore should be disregarded, and they see him as the most electable. So in that sense, Trump is like an incumbent president seeking renomination. And so that You've got so we've some. We've got two incumbents running against each other. Right, right. Well, 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 well I'm going to call it nomination, though, so that some of these people are quite qualified, but they're like people, job applicants when there's no job opening. That Republicans aren't looking, the vast majority of Republicans aren't looking to replace Trump. And so, uh, if anything, it, it, they may not realize it, but they're more auditioning for 2028 than they're doing for anything else. So in terms of the Republican nomination, you know, that's it. And for President Biden, you know, given where his numbers are and all the other circumstances, one might think that he might decide not to run, but it's kind of late for that. I mean, it's never, you know, there's not really a hard and fast deadline, but uh, they start printing the ballots in August and September, 
in various states. But, you know, at this point, I think the chances of him deciding, pulling a Lyndon Johnson and announcing, as he did in March of 68, not running, is, is pretty unlikely. So we've got our match up, you know, other than we don't know what No Labels is going to do, but uh, we can talk about that later. But to, to me, just Lord, looking at the general election, you know, when you have an incumbent president running for re-election, the election is generally a referendum on that incumbent, on that sitting president. And what's unique about this election is it's the first, as, 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 as Diane alluded to, this is the first election since 1892 that you've had back-to-back -back presidents facing off. Yet yeah, we all finally remember Grover Cleveland and Benjamin Harrison, and where you know Cleveland beat Harris, uh, Harrison was the president, Cleveland beat him, and then four years later they flipped it around. But when you've got back-to-back -back presidents, it's a unique opportunity to do a like a, a, a comparison shopping. It's like you know, put them next to each other, and where whether it's the right way of looking at it or not. For a lot of these swing voters, the 10% in the middle, because the 43% you were talking about that, are, that call themselves independents, I mean, three quarters of them aren't. Yeah. You know, it's only about eight or 10 that are truly independent. For them, um, they basically are asking themselves the question, um, was I better off before January 20th, 2021, or have I been better off since? I would be very, very surprised if President Biden won 270 electoral votes. This year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because the thing is that keep in mind that when you see these national polls, and right now Trump's got a lead of about, average is about a point. But you have to remember that, um, you know, the national popular vote in national polls are really, really important. Just ask President Al Gore and, and President uh, Hillary Clinton that that's not how you decide who wins. And that, uh, you know, in, in 2016, uh, Donald Trump lost the popular vote, but he won the Electoral College basically by a margin of 78,000 votes scattered across three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Joe Biden won by four and a half percentage points, about seven million votes, but the reality was he won by about 126,000 votes across four states. So. But what happens is, and Democrats say, well, there's a Republican advantage in Electoral College. Well, yeah, okay, that's technically true, but I think a better way of looking at it is this. In 48 states, all but Maine and Nebraska, it's sort of winner take all for electors for each state. You know, once you win a state by one vote, you get all the electors. Well, Biden won California by a margin of 5.1 million votes. So in other words, 5.1 million votes minus one uh, were flushed down a toilet. I mean, they count in the national polls, they count in the national popular vote, and they have no effect on the outcome. Two million in New York, one million each in Illinois, in Maryland, in Massachusetts. And in the last four elections, if you rank ordered states in terms of numbers of wasted votes, numbers one through seven in, in, in the last four elections all were states that went Democratic. And for I know we're going to talk about the economy a little bit, but there's another question on here about another third-party candidate. Let's say it's not no labels. Let's say it's someone that had a Super Bowl ad um, that was quite um, controversial, that was run by a PAC. And the question is, why wouldn't that siphon away votes from Republicans rather than um, well, Democrats? The thing is, it, it, it's on election day, assuming Robert Kennedy Jr. is, is, is you know, on general election ballots or in the states where he is, um, is it Robert F. Kennedy Jr., lifelong environmental activist? Okay, that would pull more from Democrats, right? Mm -hmm. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., anti-vaxxer conspiracy theorist. theorist. Yeah. Well, that would kind of pull more, but uh, more from, from the Republican side. But the thing is, I, I think with, um, and, and you don't have to pull that many to be decisive. I mean, take Jill Stein in 2016. She got next to no votes. But her vote totals in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania were bigger than Trump's margins in each of those states. So uh, it, could, it could be small and decisive. But, um, you know, I think Democrats are a lot less, or I think Democrats are a lot more worried about no labels, and neither side is that torqued up really about Bobby Kennedy Jr. I mean, because I think there will probably be some, you know, stories that are unflattering that might, you know, kind of knock him back a little bit at some point. Family's 
no, he's not, uh, probably wouldn't be the most popular person at Thanksgiving dinner. Next, part of a conversation with Vox senior politics reporter Christian Paz from our Morning Washington Journal program. He talks about his recent reporting on moderate voters and their potential impact on campaign 2024. Let's see, so you've got the three categories here, true moderates, disengaged, and the weird moderate voters. So yes, take us through each one of those categories. Absolutely. Um, the true moderate, I can start with the one that's a little bit harder to define, <laughs> uh, even though it seems pretty straightforward. Uh, a true moderate is what we think of, you know, immediately when you think of, okay, moderate voter, somebody who's not a liberal or a conservative. And it's a pretty big category. Uh, it encompasses the kind of people who you might call like middle of the road or, or uh, you know, third way kind of voters. Um, who are either to the left of most elected Republicans and to the right of most elected Democrats. Um, if you were to poll them on policy questions, which is one of the ways that researchers have tried to identify who these people are, um, the answers that you'll, they'll give and that you'll get kind of congregate around the center of the political spectrum, kind of between what a typical conservative and a typical liberal might offer as the answer to that. And one of the go-to topics on that is uh, the minimum wage. If you were to ask people what rate, you know, what level the minimum wage should be, uh, true moderates would congregate around the middle, you know, around the average of what a, a liberal and conservative might offer up as answers to that. Um, they're also the kind of people who are more open to compromise, which means that they're not as ideological as conservatives or liberals um, or other kinds of moderates, uh, which means that this is what you call like a, having a moderate disposition where, uh, you know, you might be a moderate Republican or might be a moderate Democrat, uh, but you're open to understanding the other side and maybe, you know, pushing your party or voting in a direction that kind of pushes uh, pushes you and the people, the, the candidate that you're choosing toward a bit of compromise and toward the center. Um, and they're also very receptive to individual candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, so you might have a moderate Democrat or a moderate Republican who might vote, you know, for Democrats and Republicans, but maybe with one specific candidate, they're particularly turned off or particularly attracted to somebody from the other side. Um, and you see those kinds of people in swing states. Um, I think the go-to examples last year or in 2022 uh, were places like Arizona and Pennsylvania, where you saw a lot of voters who maybe did not agree with candidates who were election deniers or who were very aligned with President, former President Trump, um, and who maybe split their ballots, split their tickets, split their mm -hmm. ballots and vote Democrat. Um, that's the true moderate. Okay. Um, so they next. tend to be a pretty big chunk of the electorate. Um, but yeah, the next category is uh, what I call the disengaged moderate. Mm -hmm. um, somebody who is not very attuned to political news, doesn't really consume a lot of, you know, media that talks about the election, that talks about, you know, politics, I might not even keep up with current events as much. Um, and so that's the first thing to understand is they're just not really in sync with the political system. And what about the um, weird moderates? And then the weird moderates are the kinds of people who are like the disengaged moderate, but they're actually engaged and actually mm. aware of what's going on. Uh, and that's what kinds of kind of draws the contrast between the weird and the disengaged moderate is both of them aren't really easy to place on the ideological spectrum because they might have a range of opinions that might be very conservative on one thing and very liberal on the other. Um, they might be, the weird moderate is also where you would find what the old school definition of a, you know, somebody who's fiscally conservative and socially liberal or something like that. Um, and the elected version of that, you know, in Congress has disappeared over the last few decades. I think it's great to uh, understand what's happened to our political parties, which is over the last few decades, we've seen both the base and the leaders of the, of the political parties um, sort themselves out ideologically between Democrats and Republicans. So you have Republicans who've always been more conservative um, in general, in terms of how people identify getting more conservative, both in what they believe and in the composition of the party. Um, and then you see Democrats who've been a mix of liberals and moderates becoming more liberal over the last few years. Um, again, both in the positions that they hold and the opinions that they hold, um, and also in how people identify within them. So what that leaves is shrinking numbers within Democrat and Republican of true moderates 
and especially shrinking numbers of weird moderates. Um, they have gone toward the center, or I guess not really the center, but toward that area that we call independent voters, mm -hmm. um, who are a really big bunch of, of people because uh, that's the big difference, right, between moderate and independent, um, is that independents include uh, very conservative, very liberal, slightly conservative, slightly liberal, moderate-ish voters, true moderates, weird moderates. Um, and that's where you find a lot of those people who might have very conservative opinions on maybe immigration, but very liberal opinions on uh, health care or on the minimum wage and those kinds of things. Also on Washington Journal this past week was David Love, a professor at Rutgers University. He talked about a recent article he wrote for The Grio on the role of Black voters in campaign 2024 and the issues motivating those voters this cycle. Yes, well, voting rights are very important because we're seeing an erosion of voting rights, particularly when it comes to uh, Black people, people of color, other marginalized groups, uh, reparations very important to me. I think that it's uh, necessary for this country to really come to terms with a long history of injustice that really, um, you know, this country has not come to terms with. Um, similar issues to that. Uh, and I think these are issues that really should be at the forefront and very often people, particularly political leaders, are ignoring. Do you think those issues are at any type of forefront when it comes to an election year like the one we're finding ourselves in now? Oh, yes. I think that everyday people care about these issues. Um, I'm concerned that the political leadership are not really focusing on it. I mean, the, you know, the, the issues that I mentioned I think are very important, but there are also others. I mean, when you consider uh, the obliteration of reproductive rights, reproductive freedoms. Uh, it seems that these laws are being passed and people are just normalizing it. And that's obviously an issue that not only affects um, African-American voters, but everyone. But I think it's important to realize that for issues such as that, uh, black people, poor people, people of color, marginalized groups tend to be affected even more disproportionately by these issues. And unfortunately, I believe because uh, a lot of politicians are beholden to the moneyed interests, uh, the people who give the contributions, they care about what those people think and they don't necessarily care as much about the voters. And I think that's why we're seeing this disconnect where people care about particular issues politicians are focused on other issues altogether. Do you think that extends to the presidential race this year with the nominee of, or the, on the Democratic side, President Biden running for another term in office and presumptively uh, former President Trump running for office as well? I think in very many ways, uh, just looking at Biden, um, it's pretty clear that the vast majority of his base as well as a majority of voters overall are against what's going on with Israel's bombing of Gaza, which, which some people, which many people would, would say is a genocide. Uh, around the country, wherever Biden goes, there are calls for him to demand a ceasefire. And it appears he's not listening, his, his administration is not listening, and he is facing a lot of uh, blowback, a lot of punishment because of that. Um, people are saying that that could very well impact the election in terms of his chances of winning. And uh, I think it's an example of how people care about particular issues, such as the threat of thousands of people dying, as many have already died in Gaza, and Biden's not listening. As far as Trump, uh, I guess his base likes him, but, um, you know, we know what we're going to get with another four years of Trump, probably more of a disaster than we had the first time around. And I think that really what we're seeing is uh, an electoral system that is not really addressing the demands, the interests of people 
on the street. We've Are noticed a lot uh, over the last couple of weeks on this program, African American, their support for the Palestinians and what's going on there. Why do you think there's so much solidarity there? Well, there has always been solidarity. I mean, for years, I mean, when you look back at uh, the Black Panthers, their solidarity with the Palestinians. Uh, Martin Luther King had things to say about the Palestinians. I think uh, the bottom line is that black people, other marginalized people, uh, they see what's going on there and they can relate to our experiences here. We've had, we have a country built on genocide and slavery. We've had so many racial explosions so many racial massacres where black people were slaughtered, mass graves. And those are things that are not taught about in the history books. And of course, this is Black History Month, so maybe we should talk more about it. But we know how it feels to be colonized internally and to face all of this violence. And that, I think, is why black people and other people um, are having this reaction because we know that this type of thing has happened to us and could actually happen to us in the future. It's as if they're testing all of these weapons to be used at a future time. House Democrats picked up a win on Tuesday as former Congressman Tom Swasey won the special election in New York's third congressional district. He picks up the seat he lost in 2022 to Republican George Santos, who was expelled from the House last year. Next, a portion of Mr. Swazi's victory remarks from Tuesday night. Thank God. You're supporting genocide. Stop supporting genocide. Despite all the attacks, despite all the lies about Tom Swazi and the squad, <laughs> about Tom Swazi being the godfather of the migrant crisis, yeah. about sanctuary Swazi, yeah. despite the dirty tricks, yeah. Yeah. despite the vaunted Nassau County Republican machine. We won. But the people of Long Island and Queens are sick and tired of the political bickering. They've had it. They want us to come together and solve problems. So now we have to carry the message of this campaign to the United States Congress and across our entire country. It's time, it's time to move beyond the petty partisan bickering and the finger pointing. It's time to focus on how to solve the problems. Yeah. It's time to get to work on immigration, yeah. on Israel, yeah. on con combating Putin, yeah. on helping the middle class, yeah. and on getting the state and local tax deduction back. Yeah. Let's send a message to our friends running the Congress these days. Stop running around for Trump and start running the country. The people are watching. They want us to start working together. So our message is very clear. Either get on board or get out of the way. Next, a conversation with New Jersey Globe reporter Joey Fox. He told us about early moves in the Garden State's U.S. Senate race, which has two prominent Democrats vying for the seat currently held by Bob Menendez. In September uh, of last year, there were uh, charges released against Senator Bob Menendez. Um, he's faced federal charges before. He, he beat them back in 2017, 2018. There was a mistrial. Um, but these new charges came out alleging that he had traded influence in the Senate in exchange for cash, in exchange for gifts, and most famously for gold bars. Um, it was an um, earthquake in New Jersey politics. I mean, within hours of these charges coming out, 
countless New Jersey politicians were calling for the senator's resignation. This had been the man, a man who was one of the most powerful figures in state politics. He was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And because of this indictment, which again, I mean, innocent or proven, until proven guilty, uh, the trial has not started yet. But because of this indictment, his uh, political fortunes have fallen dramatically. And, and we're seeing this really, really competitive Senate race pop up to succeed him. Has he said whether or not he will run for re-election? Uh, he has not said that yet, no. Uh, he has implied that he wants to, um, but if he did, he is polling in the single digits. New Jersey voters have very much turned against him. New Jersey party leaders who hold a, a really large amount of power in, in the state Democratic Party, they've all turned against him. Um, and he's spending millions of dollars on his on his legal defense rather than on any re-election campaign. So um, no, we don't know yet whether he's running again, but at the end of the day, he will almost certainly not be a U.S. senator come early 2025 after this election cycle is over. So people have sort of moved on to, from him to some degree. <clears throat> is, is there a deadline for him to declare? Um, yes. So the, the New Jersey filing deadline is in late March. Um, but New Jersey also has a very uh, party dominated system of politics that if he really wanted to seriously compete, he would already be running right now. He would already be competing for party endorsements. Um, and he's not doing that. So he's not setting some, himself up to be a competitive candidate, although he does still have another month and a half to technically decide whether he wants to run again. Who is running then? Um, so we have two uh, main candidates on the Democratic side. You have Congressman Andy Kim, who is a three-term Democrat. Uh, he launched his campaign. He was the first prominent Democrat actually to call for Menendez's resignation just a few hours after the charges came out. And the day after the charges came out, he launched his campaign. Um, so he he is in one corner, and then the other, his big opponent is First Lady Tammy Murphy. Um, she has been the First Lady of New Jersey, the wife of the governor for the last six years. Um, she's never held public office herself, but she is very much a, a powerful inside figure who New Jersey Democrats have interacted with and known for many years. Um, there are also uh, several other candidates. There, there are two activists running, Patricia Campos Medina, Larry Hamm. Uh, other people could theoretically still get in. Again, the filing deadline is still for not for a while, and there are a few Republicans as well. But in terms of talking about who is likely to be the next senator from New Jersey, um, we're really looking at Tammy Murphy and Andy Kim. So is this a safe Democratic seat? Uh, most people are treating it that way, yes. I think that if Bob Menendez, because of the because of the charges against him, if he were the nominee, that could endanger the seat. But since that seems so dramatically unlikely, New Jersey is just fundamentally it has a lot of Democrats. It has a lot more Democrats than the Republicans, and especially in a presidential year when Joe Biden, um, assuming that he's the Democratic nominee, uh, when Joe Biden is is running for president and that's at the top of the ticket, um, no one is treating this like a race that Republicans will be able to to really compete in. Just focusing on those two front runners that you talked about, have they stockpiled endorsements, and where are they with fundraising? Who's doing better than the other? Um, so, I mean, that's actually, that's sort of the really interesting question about the race right now is it's tough to tell. Who, no one can really be declared a front runner. They both have fundraised millions of dollars. They're both in sort of the $3 million range. So it's a lot of money. There's going to be a ton of money spent in this race. Lots of ads. People are going to get very sick of hearing about these two candidates. Um, Tammy Murphy has sort of the inside track on endorsements. Um, as I was saying before, these county parties in New Jersey are very powerful. Um, and in a lot of the state's biggest counties, she has guaranteed party support. Um, and the way that New Jersey's elections are run, that actually gives her like a favorable position on primary ballots. So she will literally appear in like Newark or Jersey City as the endorsed candidate of that local organization, um, which should give her a boost. Um, but on the other hand, Andy Kim has a lead in polls um, and he has an enthusiasm behind him that seems to be eclipsing Murphy's so far. Um, and so you saw this past weekend, there was a county along the Jersey Shore, Monmouth County, that held an endorsement vote that wasn't just decided by top party leaders, but was instead decided by about 500, like sort of low level, like grassroots Democrats who are, who are elected to the party. And Andy Kim won by a fairly significant margin. Um, so usually in a New Jersey election, you'd see one candidate who is clearly sort of taking the field by storm and, and the primary is decided long before it's actually held. This year, we're not seeing that at all. We're seeing a very competitive race between two people who are fundraising like real candidates, getting endorsements like real candidates, and will absolutely be real candidates all the way up through the end. What are each of their strengths? Um, 
So, I mean, I think that that is a little bit tough to say right at this moment. I think that um, Tammy Murphy's obvious strongest point is that she has this um, establishment, esp- oh my God, establishment support behind her. Um, <clears throat> that is frequently enough to win a New Jersey election, regardless of any other factor. So that gives her a huge boost. Um, but I think that you're seeing in this election year where a lot of voters are very tuned into the race, and especially they're very, very tuned into what's happening with Bob Menendez. Um, I mean, polls just show that the the Menendez charges and all of the lurid details about gold bars and everything like that have just, they have very high salience among voters. A lot of voters are hearing about that. And I think that that has given Andy Kim's campaign of running against this New Jersey system, running against the sort of the status quo that people have are sick of because of, of Menendez. Um, I think that that is where the energy behind his campaign is coming from. And I think we'll see over the coming months, whether that's just a flash in the pan or whether that's sort of part of a durable coalition that could lead to an actual win. First debate is this Sunday. Yes. What do you, what topics do you think will be brought up and asked of these candidates? What is important to the New Jersey voters? I mean, so I think a big focus of this debate is going to end up being a lot of these process issues that I've been talking about, about these county party endorsements, about the sort of the charges against Menendez and the idea of the status quo in New Jersey. That is what the candidates have spent most of their time focusing on so far. Um, And I think one thing that we're going to try to do in the debate is, in addition to focusing on that, try to suss out what some of the policy differences between these two candidates are, because they have not done that much themselves. Um, This is in general, they are two relatively liberal Democrats who have espoused views that fit relatively within the mainstream of the Democratic Party, and they have not taken many opportunities to clearly differentiate where they stand versus their opponent. They have not taken super different stances on health care or on abortion or on the war in Gaza or any of these sort of top issues that you would think would form policy divides. So that, I think, is one thing that this debate will, or maybe it won't, um, sort of make clear is, are these two candidates going to govern any differently as senators, or is this purely a race about sort of the political system about the and about what led to this rather than about how they will actually behave in office? Is the incumbent president a factor in this race? Um, I think that I think that Joe Biden and Donald Trump could both be factors in the November general election. Um, I, I don't see a ton of influence on this primary, um, largely because I think that, I mean, as you've seen in these early primary contests in other states, most Democratic voters are, are relatively strong behind Joe Biden. I mean, when they have the opportunity to, they usually just come out and vote for Joe Biden. And so in a primary contest, among multiple Democrats who are all relatively in the Biden wing of the party who who, who don't have clean breaks with the president. Um, I don't necessarily see how that would be a big factor. One thing is, though, because New, because of New Jersey's odd political system, um, in every individual county, presumably Joe Biden will have the party support in, in each county. But the two candidates, Andy Kim versus Tammy Murphy, might split support in various counties. So in one county, Tammy Murphy is running with Joe Biden, and in another county, Andy Kim is doing so. They, I'm sure they'll both endorse him, they'll both support him, but that could be, that's the one way that I could see the presidential uh, election playing into this primary. Joey Fox with New Jersey Globe. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. A reminder, this program and all of C-SPAN's campaign 2024 coverage can be found online at cspan.org campaign.